Hey folks, Larry here, the Pipecat Channel. Welcome back. Today is uh, Saturday, February 5th of 2022. And I am smoking an old favorite that I found in my quote-unquote cellar, my storage area. I found a tightly sealed and darkly stored package of original Dunhill nightcap and it is about a half a pound bag that I forgot I bought and I put away about close to five years ago close to five years ago I opened up the bag and to my great joy I found that the tobacco inside was still actually moist and even a little sticky I'm smoking some original aged Dunhill, original Dunhill nightcap. And this has uh, got the reputation of being pretty much the strongest tobacco that you can buy. I don't know how true that is. Um, I used to think it, but I've come across a few other blends that are probably close to nightcap strength. And check out what I'm holding here. Check this out. That is a Samick Flying V, the Greg Bennett version. This guitar is made in Korea, and I have modified it with these pickups. Duncan matched jazz and rock. And uh, I just thought I'd noodle around. This is the setup that I use when I feel kind of rock heavy. Talk about... Talk about a guitar style that doesn't fit somebody's body shape. I must look pretty ridiculous holding this, especially if I'm standing up in front of people. But uh, it is a nice little change from what I'm used to. The configuration on this is volume, volume, one tone. The uh, middle position of the two pickups is not coil split, it's just blend. Very simple. I keep the action as low as possible. Sometimes it even buzzes a little bit. But for the most part, the neck on this guitar stays really really straight. It stays where I put it and only varies slightly with the season and the humidity. So I've been having some fun just jamming on this thing, you know. Let's see what kind of uh, clean tone I can get out of it. Mm. I've done so many modifications to my Monoprice stage amp now that I've renamed it. It is now a uh, Chirakawa 1512 because it doesn't have the original tubes in it, doesn't have the original speaker in it. Um, I mean, you know, that's pretty much the only changes I made, but still, it's not original anymore. I put, I put a, a PV Sheffield 1230 12-inch speaker in there. I swapped out the Celestion that was in it. And um, that changed the sound drastically. But... Uh, as much as I hate to admit it, that old PV speaker in there sounds better than the selection that was in there. So I'm actually calling that a good good move. So here it is set up clean, my Samick guitar. And these children that just fit on as they try to change their world are immune to your consultation. They're quite aware what they're going through. You got the general idea. Nightcap. Nightcap will give you Red Bull wings, but unfortunately it doesn't give you any more talent than you started off with, but it makes you think it does. I'm so good. If you smoke nightcap long enough, fish will start swimming past your head, and uh, plants will grow upside down from the ceiling, and you have a craving for mushrooms, which I haven't figured that out yet.
for how good I'm playing. I got nightcap, that's all that matters. So basically, uh, today's video is no message at all. I'm finally feeling better. Stupidly smoking pipes again and cigars. Stupidly doing it in the house, although... I had my door open over there a little while ago, and it's about 20 degrees outside, so that uh, that didn't last too long, but I got some of the smoke out. Of course, I just put all that smoke back now, but um, you know, I just felt like uh, felt like sharing a little bit with you guys, showing you my uh, showing you my Samick Flying V. Um, how did I acquire this guitar? I'm glad you asked. I found a guy about maybe a, a, an hour and a half drive from here who was looking to trade any guitar that he had with any other guitar of interesting design. He didn't specify a value range or anything. My uh, my black Stratocaster, I probably would have valued somewhere around $400, I think, with all the work that was done in it. And it was absolutely pristine, completely clean, and, of course, professionally set up. It was set up so perfectly. I mean, it was a breeze to play. So I called the guy on the phone. I said, uh, what do you give me in trade for my Strat? He says, oh, he goes, it's funny, I don't have a Strat. I go, a guy with as many guitars as you say you have, you don't have a Strat? He goes, no, I don't have one. I've got Telecasters, I've you know Jaguars and Mustangs and all kinds of Fender guitars, but I don't have a Strat. What do you got? I told him. I said, I got a you know Mexican, a black Mexican Strat, and I'm just, I have too many Strats. I'm just looking to get something interesting. He goes, well, why don't you come down and see what I have? And I said, interesting. So I drove down there, and on the wall was this. I said, that's kind of cool, that Flying V. I said, I've had Samick guitars before. I had a Samick uh, RL3 Royale, they call it, which is a semi-hollow body. Um, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a single cutaway design with a strange sweep, and it was a beautiful curve. And it was a uh, sunburst color, and I loved it. And I actually parted with it because I wasn't playing it, really. It was great. It had this this same pickup configuration in it too. I I, uh, I tend to put these Duncans, these matched. Uh, what are they? JH. I forget. The, I forget what they are. The the jazz and the and the rock um, that you see paired together so often from Seymour Duncan. I put that in that guitar too, and uh, I sold it to a kid who was just starting out. He was about maybe 17 years old, and his father drove him here, and I gave him a great break on it. But I knew the quality of that Samick guitar. It was. When Greg Bennett, who was some designer from some other company, I forget which one, um, moved over to Samick Guitars to try and increase their, you know, their marketability, basically, um, he came up with spe spectacular versions of guitars. This was one I had never played before, but I figured if it was a Greg Bennett Samick, it might be worth it. So I put my Strat in this guy's hand, and he took this thing off the wall, and I tuned it up. And uh, the guy had about 20 amps in his, out in his uh, studio room. And so he plugged into one, I plugged into another one, we jammed a little bit. He's like, I love it! And I'm like, I love it! So they were probably about, I would say roughly equal value, maybe. This one might have been a little bit less valuable because it wasn't a real, real marketable name. But it played great, and, and I loved the design, and it was black, like the strand I was trading it for. And the guy says... You know, I'm happy if you're happy. I said, fine. I go, if, if you find any flaws in my guitar, you call me up and let me know, and, and I'll save your number. Same thing. He goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. He goes, and if you get bored, you want to trade it back for something else, give me a call. I'm always looking for new stuff. I never did actually go back to see that guy. That was probably about maybe five years ago. But um, I've been very happy with this since I got it. This sits in my office back there because I have most of my amps are back there in my office up against the wall. I've got... A couple of uh, hybrid Dean Markleys from the 80s. I've got um, a nice collection of PV amps. Uh, my Classic 30 is actually still out here, but the other half, the extension cab, is back there in the office. I've got uh, one, two, two, two Classic 50s back there. One of them's a 410, and the other one's the 212 PV Classic 50s. Um, I've got a Bogner Alchemist half stack back there. Um, what else is back there? Oh, just all kinds of stuff that I've collected, that I'm, half of which I'll probably never use again. I actually busted out my Markleys uh, back there in the office a couple of weeks ago. Plugged them in. They hadn't been turned on in so long. One of them has a special value to me. Um, 
I've got two markings back here. One of them is a uh, one of them is an RM forty SR. An RM forty SR. SR means single row, and that means that it's a forty watt all tube. Well, not not all tube. The tube uh, tube conditioned solid state power amp hybrid from probably about eighty three, I think, and um, and that one has always sounded great. It's never had a problem. It still sounds phenomenal if you like that early 80s kind of fuzz crunch that they have in them. And then I acquired another one. It's an RM150DR, which is a 150-watt dual row, a true two-channel amp, two separate channels with all separate controls. They both have that little button that you can push to, to disengage the tubes and go all solid state for a super clean sound. Um... The beauty of these amps is the headroom that they have. They're both 112 combos, and they're both beige colored. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. I should probably just take one out and show you sometime. But the first one I described to you always sounded great, the 40-watt version. Um, I have always loved it, and I had it in my bedroom for a long time with my Telecaster, which it particularly loved. The other one, the RM150DR, I got that one uh, in repairable shape from uh, a, a seller. And the guy, um, the guy said, you know, I'm selling it as is. It's got weird little issues. A couple of the pots sound like they're really hissing and crackling and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, I, I can't always get the same repeatable tone out of it. If anybody wants to try and rescue it, I'll give it to you cheap. I don't remember what I paid for it, but I got it for a song, uh, so to speak. Um, and I, I had a friend, and his name was Tony. Tony um, was the oddest person you, you ever met. He was so cool, man. He had the biggest collection of vintage guitars and amps I've ever seen. And he kept them all in this uh, rented room, huge room, in an old repurposed factory building in a town not too far away from here where a lot of bands rented rooms to go practice. When I met Tony, I was actually playing, like I said, I'm a bass player. I was playing bass with an 80s tribute band who practiced down the hall from him. And whenever we would take a break, I would hear this music coming out of that one room down the hall. So one day I asked one of the guys in my band, whose room is that? Oh, that's Tony. You don't know Tony? I'm like, no, I don't think I've ever met him. So they go over, they pound on the metal door and he opens it up and this hippie looking dude standing there with the, you know, little, little Van Dyke and, you know, and um, he, he opens up the door, and he was the coolest, strangest cat, you know, that, that I'd met in a long time, and it, I instantly liked him. He had, I looked at the walls and what he had hanging on him, on the walls, and it was eye candy. I was like, oh my God, you trust this place with all these things? He had Beatles-era Epiphone casinos up there. He had ancient Les Pauls, I mean, everything, old country gentlemen guitars and tellies and strats and you name it, man, and every one of them was vintage. Some of, some of them were rare birds I never thought I'd see in a lifetime, and I said, dude, you trust this door with a padlock on it and the outside door of the building to protect all that? I hope you have huge insurance. He's like, nah, why would I have insurance? I'm like, Wow. He goes, plus, he goes, uh, they're never alone, my stuff. I'm like, why not? He goes, I usually sleep here. And he indicated in one corner he had a sofa. And um, he goes, I, I basically live here. I'm like, wow, how the hell do you do it? He goes, well, you know, I got a house. You know, I, I think he might have lived with his parents or some other family somewhere. But the freedom this guy exhibited was amazing. And I instantly was envious of him. So he let me take down any guitar I wanted and play on it. So I said, who maintains these for you? He goes, what are you talking about, who? I'm like, well, who, who does your repairs and stuff? He goes, I do. I go, you do? He goes, yeah, I'm a tech, I do it all. I said, no kidding. Hey, I said, I got this Dean Markley, you know, RM150DR. Uh, uh, He's like, oh, he goes, you're talking about those tan-colored things from the 80s? But yeah, he knew the amp. 
He says, yeah, you want me to take a look at it? I said, well, it's got a lot of problems. He goes, just bring it in. I go, well, it's got the, he goes, don't describe it. Just bring it in. I'll go through it. I said, well, yeah, but can I afford you? He said, he goes, uh, I don't charge much. He goes, he goes, for a friend, we'll give you friend prices. He goes, I, I instantly trust you. Bring it in. I did. Tony had that in it for about six months. And every every couple of weeks, he'd send me an email saying, "Hey, here's an update. I found this. I found that. I'm trying to get a replacement for this, which is rare. You know, whatever. Parts are still they were hard to get. And um, the band I was in eventually, actually, I broke up that band, not because I wanted to. That uh, this was the time when." Um, when my legs began to fail me. I couldn't stand anymore. And I couldn't hold the bass against my chest anymore. Um, I, I've since kind of recovered from that, but um, long story short, I had a neuromuscular thing, I've mentioned it in some other videos, that prevented me from doing it, and I had to stop. I, I almost went in a wheelchair that year. So I, I had to break up. Well, I left that band. I don't think they continued without me. Not for long. But um, Tony and I stayed in contact because of my amp and other reasons too. He was just a good guy. Sometimes he'd call me on the phone and we'd talk for three, four hours at a time. And then one day, um, about six months in, I hadn't heard from Tony for a couple of weeks and I was thinking of calling him and uh, I got a phone call from another mutual friend of ours. This guy's spectacular guitar player, phenomenal guitar player and brilliant dude at that. His name is Chris. Chris was old friends with Tony and with me. And he would, in fact, he and I and Tony would jam once in a while in Tony's room. So Chris called me up. It was a Sunday. And he said, um, I don't know if you heard, but Tony passed away. I said, who Tony? It was Tony, Tony. I won't say his last name. I'm like, no way. He's like, yeah, you know, he... The guy had a drinking problem. It was pretty severe, and I guess it took its toll on him. He says, yeah, Tony's uh, Tony's gone. And so once the sadness and all that, dealing with that and going to the wake were over, his sister, Tony's sister, posted ads basically in that rehearsal building saying anyone who had anything in Tony's room that didn't belong to Tony, call this number and let me know, and I'll open up the room and and you can go in and see if you can find it. So uh, again, long story short, after a few correspondences back and forth with his sister, I met her there one day on a weekend. She opened up the room for me, and it was sad. I mean, everything was in disarray. A lot of people, uh, you know, with, with as many collectible guitars as that man had, um, I'm sure there were a few people looking to get their hands on some of them for free, you know. I wouldn't do that to that family. I made an offer to his sister. I said, if any of these guitars... Um, if you have trouble finding homes for them and you want to sell them, let me know, okay? Just leave me on the list. I go, but for now, you do with them what you think you need to do. And I found my amplifier and it was in pieces. The speaker was over there. The, the, the controls, you know, the chassis was pulled out and was over there. There were tools lying all around the chassis on a tool bench. And here's the body and there's the cover and, you know, and I said to her, I go, uh, I found most of the amp. Give me a little time to kind of put it back together so I can carry it out of here. And she says, well, I don't have time for you to sit here making all electronic connections. I go, no, no, I just want to screw the chassis together and then take it. You know, screw the combo amp back together again just so it's one piece so I can carry it. And um, she let me do that. And when I got home, um, there was one component missing, the reverb tank. I hadn't found it while I was there. And so I called her on the phone again. I said, there's one piece missing, and I wonder if you'd let me back in the room to look for it. And she said, well, you know, at this point, pretty much everything's out of the room now. Anything we couldn't identify, well, it's junk. I said, well, I hope you didn't toss my reverb tank. She says, what's that? What does it look like? I described it to her. I said, well, it kind of, you know, it's a long a long metal thing with, you know, screw holes on the end of it and uh, and little wire jacks coming off of it and it's probably inside a fake leather bag. She said, oh, 
there's one of those in Tony's room at the house. I said, oh, well, I don't know if it's going to be mine. She goes, well, come over and take a look at it and see if it's yours. So what I had to do is I had to go look in my other Dean Markley amp, and I took a cell picture of the reverb tank, brought it with me, and I went to Tony's family home. They let me up in his room, simple little room, because he probably wasn't there most of the time. Sure enough, sitting on the, on the table right next to his bed was this reverb tank, and it was an exact match. I don't know what he was doing with it, but it probably came from my amp, and he, he had brought it home for some reason. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was testing it with another amp or something. It wasn't hooked to anything. It was just lying there. She says, look, whatever it is, take it. I go, I'm pretty sure that's mine. Said, I'll take it with you. So I, I, I took it home. I put it in the amp. Sure enough, perfect match. And I thought, well, let's find out what state the amp was in after I got it home. And so I uh, plugged it in. I probably put a guitar much like this one, if not this one, in it, because this was in my office back there, and and just started, you know, I hooked everything back up, and I started going through it, and apparently, Tony had completed whatever repairs he was doing before he passed away. He, he must have completed it, and he was probably about to put it back together, and then if I know Tony, he probably was going to call me to say, surprise, the amp is done. He just never got to do that, but when I put it together and played through it, it was mint. It sounded phenomenal. It's a 150 watt, you know, 112 combo hybrid amp. And 150 watts means you can turn the clean sound up high enough to blow the roof off the house without it breaking up if you want it. But it's also a dual channel amp. So when you switch the distortion channel, you can put all the cheese you want on it, man. And it screamed 80s sound. That amp was from 1982 whereas its little brother was a year younger than it. Um, so now I've got both of those sitting side by side back there in my office. And that RM150 DR, as long as I live, I won't part with it because it reminds me of Tony so much. I never even got to pay him. I only gave him, I gave him initially $90 because he had to buy replacement parts. He showed me the invoices. He didn't even want to put a charge on top of them. He just wanted me to pay for them. He's like, oh, you know, I, I outlaid the money. Here's the bill. You know, here's the receipt. Because I just I paid for them in advance, you know. Um, so you would only you'd owe me this much. I haven't figured out the repair charges yet, but we'll see. He never did charge me for his repairs. I just paid for the parts. So I've got that amp with Tony's, you know, blood, sweat, and tears in it, and uh, I'll never part with it because of that. Um, when I started this video, I had no idea I was going to talk about that that amp. Um, I should probably show it to you, but. Uh, well, maybe if I edit out some of the stuff that I've already recorded at the beginning of this conversation, maybe I will. Uh, maybe I will bring it out there. This right now, I can see I've gone well over the half hour mark with this, so I'm going to stop this right here. Um, and uh, I'll add additional content after I edit out the first half of all the bullshit that uh, I was going to talk about. And I'll show you that amp. How about that? All right. Hey, stay tuned. Well, this is it. This is the. Uh, the 1982 Dean Markley RM150DR hybrid amplifier. Um, it's got, uh, like I said, a, a, a tube signal conditioner, and it's got a uh, solid state power output. The thing about it is, you can turn the tubes off with this amp. It's kind of neat. Um, it's got this little uh, FET, FET in and out. <laughs> That's with the tubes engaged. If you knock them out, though, oops, the button's sticky. Come on. One of the problems it has is that that button sticks. No, I can't get it to stay in. Anyway, the tubes are engaged, and, and the little uh, moment, it's not a momentary button, it actually is broken inside, so it doesn't stay in sometimes. But uh, if I bypass the tubes, all the volume will drop out of the amp. I'll just hold it and show you. With tubes. Without tubes. Tubes engaged. Tubes cut out. But they're permanently engaged until I can fix that little switch. So it's uh, not as pristine as I thought. There still are a couple little things. In. A couple of pots still 
still crackle a little bit, but if you just roll them a few times, that goes away. They're just dusty. I don't know how long they sat on Tony's bench, but this is the amp, and I love it. It's a real, it's a real early 80s vintage little monster. I've got the volume on this thing, the clean volume. I've got the master on about three. I've got the preamp on two. Uh, the bass is on about maybe seven. Mid-range on about eight. Treble seven. Present seven. And the reverb on about four. The reverb, reverb gets really deep. The neck position pickup on the guitar. Put it in the middle, it's kind of neat. Listen, do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? position pickup on the clean channel. Now, the dirty channel, the other row, switches right to it. It is in a real second channel. They do not share EQs. I have to match them to make them similar. It's kind of fuzz distortion. It's kind of uh, muddy. Pull the bass out. And these pots, by the way, are really sensitive. They have a big sweep. They do a lot. One, one pot makes all the difference. For instance, here's the mid-range. I've got it on about, what, eight right here? If I roll it down even a little, see? Treble. All the difference in the world. try to play leads while the camera is on. Neck position. Of course, I'm still dealing with this bad middle finger here. Can you see the scar? The surgery scar from the trigger finger release. It's like right, right here. You can kind of not even really see it anymore, but the finger still hurts, I'll tell you. Can't really straighten it all the way sometimes. I can right now because I've been using it, but anyway. Yes, that's the reason why I'm playing so bad. Yeah, that's it. The 
The volume on this amp right now is really low because I don't want to piss off my neighbors. But this thing can crank. The volume, the, the master and preamp knobs are your volume knobs really and uh, the master especially. It's just as the, the, the sweep of that pot is every bit as big as the sweep of the rest of the pots. So if you move it just a little bit, it makes all the difference in the world. I'm hardly moving that. And it's already too loud for my neighbors. Sounds like 80s mud, um, but you can get it super bright too. It's if anything, this amp has too much controllability. You can get mosquito tones, and you can get under the bubbling mud tones out of this thing. And um, your playing makes all the difference. Mine is shitty, so. But anyway, that's the amp. I just wanted to show it to you. It's just kind of a an old ancient treasure of mine. I don't know that it's really worth anything because you know how marketability goes. Only what people are looking to collect. That's what. That's what sets the value of the amp. If no one's out collecting these because they're not popular, then no matter how great the amp may be or what kind of condition it's in, it's not going to matter. It won't be worth anything. If they can't resell it to anybody, then no one's going to pay anything for it. I'm not that way. I buy them to play them. You know, I got a bunch of amps because I play my amps. You know, I, I mess with them all the time. <laughs> Markley RM 150DR and this is not about the amp this is about my friend Tony who I miss very much Tony if you can hear me if you're watching this somehow thank you for this I know I owe you the money but don't haunt me okay and I'll, I'll give it to you when I see you how's that all right and I will buddy so that's it I'm gonna move my my camera way back where it was before okay well thank you for tuning in to the madness today and uh, i always appreciate you visiting um throw a like on the video if you enjoyed it sub the channel if you like 
I don't monetize, so it really doesn't matter. But I like to see the numbers because it makes me feel good. That's the only reason why I do it. But thank you for visiting the Pipecat channel once more. And uh, stay safe out there. Love the music. Love your friends. Love your pipe if you smoke one. And uh, I, will, uh, I will definitely be talking to you soon. So you guys take care of yourselves. Be kind to one another. Pipecat out. <laughs>